We begin, as we must, with the pandemic and what it showed us about how we deal with a crisis and whether our governments are up to it. Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite joined with economist author Adrian Wooldrich to bring us the wake-up call, a penetrating look at which countries did well and which did not. Britain and America, you know, two of the countries that have led the world have done it incredibly badly. Um, if just monitor it by the number of deaths per million, well over 800 deaths per million. By contrast, Germany down around 150, and especially those Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, you know, they're, they're in very small numbers, three, sometimes as few as five deaths per million, sometimes 20, 30 deaths per million. And so there has been a real difference, as you put, between good government and bad government. Indeed, government has been the difference between living and dying in many places. And what accounts for that? There are various theories. I mean, for example, that Asia, particularly Taiwan, Korea, and to some extent China have done well because it's more of a collectivist approach to society rather than individualistic. I think we should come back to China in a second, but, but on, the, on the broad terms, I think that's a too good an excuse for the West um, on two, several different levels. Firstly, if you look at any measure of other things to do with state efficiency, schools, you know, whose who's schools are doing well, it's the same set of countries are doing well. Whose who's general health systems lead to long life expectancy? The same thing. Virtually every barometer of whether a government is working well or not has been moving in Asia's direction over the past 20, 30 years. And it's just, that's the reason why it's a wake up call. Arguing about consensus, yes, there is an advantage there, but it's the kind of advantage which gives you a 10 or 20% advantage. It's not the sort of advantage which explains somebody being 20 or 30 times better. I mean, you, David, most of in our day jobs, when we look at a company and one company is sort of 20% better than another one, you think that other one's in trouble. In this case, countries were 20 times better. And that brings me on to the second thing. If you look at South Korea, look at Seoul, London, and New York. They're roughly the same size. It's Seoul's a little bit bigger. And yet New York has lost over 25,000 people. London, well over 6,000. Seoul's lost a few dozen. And this is the place that bought Parasite. It's the place for some of the world's largest nightclubs. It's a place that bought K-pop, which I know you listen to all the time. It's a vibrant, chaotic, democratic city with a lot of creativity, crowded subways, huge things. It's got exactly the same kind of dynamic as London or New York. It just happens to be a lot better run. And it's run because people have paid attention to government. Uh, one of the things you do in your book is go through the growth of government, particularly since post-World War II in this country, the United States. But also you talk about the fact that maybe government sometimes is doing too much in some areas as it's doing too little in others. How do we determine what government should be doing and what it should be keeping its mitts off of? That is the absolutely kind of key question in the center of this. What's clear is that those people at the moment who've looked at what's happened in COVID and think, well, the answer is we must spend more money. Uh, well, the West has been doing that for decades now. You look at what happened in Asia, I mean, the, what's effectively happened, what happened with cars is that Japanese went off and built better, smaller, quicker cars, and they took over the car industry, and then the West bought back. Um, in Detroit, everywhere, we began to make small cars too. Singapore came up with a new way of doing government, of doing it smaller. Um, we should accentuate that to Republicans who are listening to this. It's a much smaller government than America has, but it's a lot better. And what's happened is that the rest of Asia has been copying that model, including China, which we can come on to, and America and the West have not. So it's like one of those revolutions that people haven't spotted. And I think the key bit is you have to have government focusing on what it does best, on, on education, on health, but even then being quite careful about where you, where you draw things, handing some responsibilities to citizens, but not mandating things. And America has gone into a mess um, and yes, on the whole, I come from the small government side of the ledger, without a doubt. But on some things like health, I think they're having a, a, a national health service of a sort is not only morally right, you wouldn't end up with quite so many poor people dying in such terrible circumstances from COVID, but also much cheaper. America spends, this is the most frightening number, which the health care lobby of the kind of private insurance and all that lot, they, they desperately want to hide. America spends more money per head on public healthcare, let alone all the money we spend on private healthcare, 
So it's more money on public health care than Sweden does, kind of socialist Sweden. And it gets a lousy deal for it in terms of the, the, the coverage for people. So have a much simpler system and it would work better. You've mentioned China uh, a couple of times here. Let's talk about a uh, compare and contrast of China versus the United States or the rest of the West for that matter. There are some people who come out of the COVID-19 crisis and say, look, at an autocratic state may be the way to go. And what China has developed there is something, a marriage of capitalism of a form with a very strong state-controlled economy. Uh, what do you say to that? Is that a better model as a, a practical matter? Well, and the, the answer is no. Um, if you compare China against America, there is no question at all that China handled COVID a lot better. China claims a death rate per million of three. Well, I'm not sure I entirely believe that, but multiply it by 10. Imagine they're hiding 90% of all their deaths, which I don't think any of us actually, to be honest, do think they're anywhere near that, but it might push them up to 30. That would still be 20, 25 times better than America. That does not mean that democracy is worse. Um, you, you look at all the other countries that have done well, look at um, all the South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, all those ones are democracies, but also New Zealand, Australia, and some of the European countries, they're all democracies. By contrast, most authoritarian regimes did pretty uselessly this. So you wouldn't have wanted to get COVID in Russia, in Iran, let alone North Korea. So I think there is a sort of false positive in terms of authoritarianness. Do you come away from your book with hope in this sense I, I lose hope when we've tried it and it hasn't worked. I'm not sure we've tried many of the things you've suggested. You look back through history and the time when Western countries have suddenly begun to realize the necessity of reforming government, of changing things, has always been times of competition. Now, if you look at the kind of welfare states most of us live under, where you need hospitals, pensions, all those things, most of those began to come in roughly 100 years ago from now, now back in the sort of er, very early 20th century. Well, some of the people pushing forward this were from sort of liberal, bleeding heart sorts who cared enormously about what happened to the poor, and rightly so. But many of the other people who really pushed it were conservatives, like the young Winston Churchill. And the reason why they did that was nationalist reasons. They were terrified about what was happening in Germany, People in Britain, people in France, people in the United States even thought they needed to have a sort of better quality population to deal with this. And I think what's interesting now in America is you, you have a disaster, whereas we've all agreed America has done unbelievably worse than its principal you know, long-term rival, China. Well, it, the more that China keeps on getting ahead, the more it's gonna force America to wake up and do things. And that is what we all want because we all want liberal democracy in the end to push through and come to it. And that is sort of really the point of this book. You know, it's called a wake up call. It's, it points out that we're losing at the moment, but we certainly have got the capacity to come back. And most of the answers aren't actually that difficult compared with the kind of contortions that people in the private sector and other places have put themselves through.